Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Hugh Garavan. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Vermont. Uh, the University of Vermont is one of the data collection sites for the uh, ABCD study, and I'm one of the co-PIs here along with Alexi Bader. I'm also an associate director on the Coordinating Core Center. And my main involvement, at least early on in the ABCD project, was in the ABCD sample and recruitment and all those procedures for getting the sample. So that's what I'll be talking to uh, us what I'll be talking about today in this presentation and you know straight up I will agree with uh, some of you who probably might be thinking along the same lines that you know this is not the most exciting of topics um, you know the ABC data set is rich everybody's interested in the mental health and the cognitive and the brain imaging measures um, but it is useful to know how we got the sample to understand the recruitment procedures so I think this might help inform you and your interpretation of what the results mean in, in uh, the population to which you can generalize your findings and so on and so forth. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. How do we sample the population? How do we recruit it? And then most importantly, how, what are we doing about maintaining uh, the sample as is? How are we keeping people in the study? How are we retaining and trying to minimize uh, attrition? Okay, so the learning objectives of this lecture. Um, first and foremost, obviously, to convey how the ABCD study uh, sample was recruited. So we'll talk about all the mechanics of that. Uh, to describe the diversity of the samples. So we made efforts to have broad demographic diversity in the sample. We'll talk about that. We do, however, avoid using the term representative sample. And I will try to talk through some of the reasons why uh, and maybe how we might better describe the sample. Representative is a phrasing that has a lot of baggage. Um, and then I'd like to uh, hopefully give you a sense of our ongoing retention practices for the study. So clearly it's one thing to recruit a sample of about 1,200 kids, sorry, 12,000 kids, but to keep that sample participating for 10 years, especially during the adolescent years, is a considerable challenge. So we will talk a little bit about that. Um, I guess another learning objective today would be to strongly encourage you, if you too are thinking about doing a study of this size, that you should definitely do it. This is a very, very good idea and you will enjoy every single moment of it. Ish. Okay, um, it's been a lot of work, but uh, it has been very rewarding. Uh, hopefully you'll get a sense of that over the course. Just to back up for a second, you know, why so large a sample? Why do we care about uh, re recruitment? This is actually a slide that I've used before uh, when just chatting about uh, the ABC study and its large sample size. And I realized that a couple of the bullet points here, especially the last two, are particularly pertinent to this question about the sampling and the recruitment procedures. But just to run through it, you know, because um, you know, it's somewhat controversial to put a lot of resources into one study, into one cohort, um, and is it really necessary? So I think, you know, uh, to have so large a sample, it obviously provides, it really should, a comprehensive survey of neurodevelopment. Um, we have rich characterization, uh, very, very frequent assessments. I'm sure you know all about the details or you will by the time this course is over. Um, that enables us to study specific groups of interest. Um, you might have a particular hypothesis about, you know, make it up and maybe a certain amount of early life adversity or a certain you know a genotype you can then delve within these 12,000 participants and find kids that match that profile of interest to you and your hypothesis and then also related to that and this is not trivial one of the beauties of having a large sample is that in addition to finding the group that's of interest to you you can also then find match controls. You can hunt them in the sample for individuals who are matched on the recruitment side, socioeconomics, uh, other life experiences, whatever you think might be a potential confounding factor, these sorts of things that threaten the internal validity of most studies with a large, large sample, you can sort of um, get around that issue by careful selection of not just the group of interest, but also by the matched controls. Um, you're going to learn a lot about this throughout the course. The large sample size uh, gives sufficient statistical power to detect small effects and then also allows for you know, numerous types of very rigorous data analysis, built-in replication, and so on and so forth. Again, they'll be covered in other lectures. But the two things I would like to draw attention to, uh, again, that's pertinent to the whole issue of the sampling and the, the 
the, the diversity of the sample is that if you recruit enough individuals, you'll then have hopefully sufficient individual variation. This will then enable us to disentangle demographic factors that are, as you all know, so very, very often confounded in our studies. So issues like you know, race, urbanicity, socioeconomic status, these things tend to be confounded. It's very hard to disentangle them. We might be able to uh, do so with this larger sample. And then this, of course, enables us to ask if the, any effect of interest, whatever your hypothesis is, does it vary with subpopulations? Are there sex specific or race specific uh, or income specific risk factors for uh, you know, substance use psychopathology for the consequences of that? You know, within our large, large sample, there very likely exists considerable heterogeneity and we can perhaps get a good handle on that and look at subgroups, subpopulations of interest with a large uh, demographically diverse sample as we have in ABCD. So this all kind of speaks to this larger issue of population neuroscience. So this, um, it's a bit wordy, but essentially population neuroscience, it refers to the application of epidemiological practices, you know, things like purposeful sampling uh, to neuroscience research. Typically, as you all know, we tend to recruit relatively small, relatively homogenous, relatively convenient samples. Um, in contrast, what the population neuroscience approach is doing is in fact, you know, it's quite opposite. Rather than getting, you know, a clean sample that has your variable of interest, we instead try to just embrace the variation that exists across members of the population and strive to identify the broad range of biological, social, and environmental influences on your biological function and development. So essentially, embrace the heterogeneity. Uh, let's um, recruit broadly, measure extensively, and see how all these miscellaneous factors uh, fall together. Um, of course, you know, one of the challenges here is that an approach like this, as it says in last put a point, is then likely going to reveal a much more complex tapestry of ideological mechanisms. Um, if we are looking at subpopulations, if we're looking at miscellaneous variables that will stratify our sample, it's very, very likely that we're going to just find many more complicated explanations for human behavior. Um, so life is going to get a bit more uh, complicated, but you know, so be it. It seems like that then is being truer to the data rather than just averaging everybody together and uh, assuming that there are simple and single causes for whatever phenomena is of interest to you. To just flesh that out, you know, will this matter? Will these demographic differences matter? This is a study from a few years ago, so it's from a different study, um, but a, one that's been going for, for long, or it's about 10, 11 years old now, the imaging study. And I won't get into any of the details uh, here other than just to uh, make the case that what we were trying to do in this particular study was uh, see if we could identify the predictors of cannabis onset use. So obviously, you know, cannabis use is becoming a topic of increased interest given the increased availability and decriminalization and so on and so forth of cannabis. We were trying to understand, could we identify which kids will go on and use cannabis uh, in their adolescent years? So we assess kids at age 14, and then a couple of years later, identified the kids who had gone on to use cannabis, and then try to see, well, what was it about their uh, profiles, you know, genetic, psychological, mental health, neuroimaging at age 14 that might predict cannabis use at age 16? And what we did, and this is the point of the slide, is we looked at this separately for boys and girls. And so the predictors for the males are on the left-hand side, the predictors for the females are on the right-hand side, uh, hopefully you can get a chance to just to scan through some of the variables that uh, turned out to be predictive of future cannabis use. The point that I want to make just for now is that um, a number of variables were common to the boys and the girls. So for example, just starting from the top, if the parent used cannabis, if the boy or the girl themselves at age 14 had used any cigarettes or alcohol, then those were predictive of cannabis use in that kid two years later. But there were other factors that were particular to the females or that were particular to the males. And especially when we look at the brain imaging data, the brain predictors for cannabis use in boys were not at all predictive of cannabis use in girls. And the brain predictors that were predictive of cannabis use in girls were not at all predictive in boys. 
So without getting into any of the explanations as to why that might be or what these brain regions might be reflecting, the point here is just to convey to you that some of these demographic differences may prove to be very consequential and that we may need to start attending to, uh, attending to them and doing our analyses in subgroups or stratifying by sex, again, rather than just averaging over everybody. And that's enabled by um, having a large sample size, such as we have in ABCD. One last example, and these are preliminary, uh, this is not yet published. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, Sean Adis, is interested in uh, BMI. And we did an analysis just trying to find in ABCD, what are the correlates of uh, uh, body, mass, body mass index? Um, and we looked across a, you know, a number of biological and cultural and behavioral measures. The results there are shown on the, the left-hand side of the screen. I'll just leave them up there for a second. You can see um, you know, being male, so you know, males are heavier. Uh, increased puberty, especially in females, is predictive. Uh, being Hispanic or black, uh, prematurity, so if the kid was born premature, that's predictive of body mass index 10 years later. Um, a prenatal, a prenatal uh, nicotine exposure, birth weight, puberty, PA refers to physical activity, and so, so on and so forth. Um, and then screen time measures from either the child report or the parent report. So we ran this analysis, we find that these are the predictors that are, um, these are the variables that are most predictive of, or sorry, that you know correlate strongest with uh, body mass index. And of course, one of the things that jumped out at us, as you'll see, is, you know, race and ethnicity seem to come through. Um, this is very busy. Please don't uh, pay too much time uh, attending to uh, what the particular effects are. The point I just want to make is that if we repeat this analysis, we look at these variables, but we do it separately for different races and ethnicities we see some similarities, but we also see some differences. So some variables that are correlated with BMI when we collapse everybody together are either also correlated uh, with BMI when we look at the race and ethnicity separately, but some are quite different. They are stronger, they have a stronger correlation in one racial group or one ethnic group than in another. Uh, it's variable. And that's true for biological factors as well as more social, cultural, or lifestyle factors. Again, the point here is not to draw too much attention to these particular results, but it's just to make the case that these demographic variables, these demographic, demographic factors are likely to be important. And collapsing across everybody is likely to obscure effects that might be that might pertain to just one subgroup or other. So this is in part the motivation for why we wanted to recruit a large, but also a demographically diverse sample uh, when we set out to, uh, uh, with the ABCD study. So what do we wanna do? Who did we wanna rec recruit into the study? So first and foremost, you know, the way we define it, we wanted a sample that broadly reflects the US population of nine and 10 year olds. And the variables we focused on were sex, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and urbanicity. But you know, straight up, we didn't really do much uh, with regards to sex. We just sort of assumed that if we go out to schools, and um, we'll come back to that in a second, that we would probably get a, you know, a relatively even mix of boys and girls, which we did. Um, we did pay attention to race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status, because we wanted to make sure we had diversity there. Urbanicity, we knew we were always going to fail. Um, most large neuroimaging centers are in, you know, in urban areas. So we knew that we would probably underrepresent a more rural youth. And, um, and again, I think we just had to live with that fact uh, for the study. So it's just one caveat to be aware of that our sample skews towards more urban than rural. The demographic targets we set were based on the American Community Survey. So this is a survey of approximately three and a half million ha uh, households that's conducted annually by the uh, US Census Bureau. So that survey gave us a kind of the big picture as to you know, what are the sociodemographics of the nine and 10 year olds in the US at the time that we were recruiting. So those were the targets that we were trying to match to. Our goal was to recruit about 11,000 participants 
um, including 1,600 twins. So 800 twin pairs, half of them um, monozygotic, half of them dizygotic, with a goal to arrive, you know, after attrition, by the time the study was done 10 years in at approximately 10,000. So that was our, our goal. Um, the target number is, you know, increased as we realized we were reaching our targets. Um, many of us, uh, you know, were told that we wouldn't be successful. There was no way we were going to be able to recruit 11,000 participants in two years. Ooh, many of us might have thought the same, uh, but we surprised ourselves and we found that we were actually doing very, very well. So we kind of pushed up our targets and, you know, sites varied their targets as recruitment went along. Some realized that they weren't going to do as well as they had anticipated. Some realized that they were going to do better. So we shifted the numbers as we, as we went along. Uh, we also uh, wanted to ensure that we had good representation of lower income families. So we made uh, special efforts, especially towards the ends of the study, to ensure that we increased representation there. So this is what we wanted to do. And this is, these were the target goals. Um, we knew this would have to be a multi-site study. Right, so there is no way uh, one center could get a 12,000 kids and, and make a demographic and have them be all demographically diverse. So we knew that you know this would be uh, this would involve recruitment from across the U.S. Here is a map showing the uh, uh, all the sites that participated in the study. There were 22 sites in total. Um, there's Inevitably, uh, you know, going to be, uh, you know, differences, you know, geographical differences as a consequence of this multi-site recruitment strategy. I'm just going to draw attention to one, and this is for my good friend, Angie, because I know as you're watching this lecture, I know not all of you are in Florida, but I know that some of you are, and you'll be watching this in late October, and I'm up here in Vermont, in this kind of very northerly region, and uh, the Florida people are down here. Uh, some demographic or some differences that might be pertinent. Uh, how much sunlight does each participant get? Um, just to uh, flesh this out for you, that's my site uh, here in Vermont. That's the average daily sunlight. And for the people uh, there uh, sunning it in Florida, that's how much sunlight you get. Um, another very pertinent variable, um, temperature. That's the average daily air temperature up here in Vermont. And that's yours. And Angie, if you're watching this, I really hope you're enjoying it while I'm probably up here shivering in the cold. Good luck to you. Okay, um, back on target. Uh, who do we want to recruit? So the challenge here across these multiple sites is, you know, we can set targets for ourselves to match the American Community Survey, but we also have to compromise with the demographics that are available at our sites. There's no point setting impossible targets for sites. So these are the race ethnicity targets that we had, again, from both the American Community Survey and also the National Center for Education Statistics. And the latter is a survey information on schools. And um, as we get into here in a few seconds, our recruitment strategy involved going to schools. So knowing what were the demographics available at different schools across the country, matching that to the American Community Survey, matching that to uh, who was available at our site. So what were the demographics of individuals who fell within the recruitment catchment areas of each site? That's what kind of guided the large, uh, the, the full sampling strategy. So here we just as a quickie, we, you know, we break the sites down by whether they're in the Northeast, the Midwest, the South or the West. Again, what we're trying to do is, you know, exploit the demographics that are available at the different sites so that when so that we can set reasonable targets for sites so that their demographic targets are consistent with who lives literally within the catchment areas of their sites but do that in a way that when we complete the aggregation across all sites we will match more or less to our race ethnicity targets as uh, given to us by the american community survey so that was the goal. Uh, how do we recruit? So as I've already mentioned, it was done through the school system. Um, why? Uh, you know, 97, 98, 99% of kids are uh, in schools, in the nine, uh, nine and 10 year olds. Um, school systems, if we include public, private and charter, this enables a standardized recruitment across all sites. So we didn't want to have different sites utilizing different recruitment strategies 
because each recruitment strategy will bring with it a certain bias as to how effective it is, who it reaches, who gets recruited. We don't want to bias that with um, other you know, site-specific uh, differences that might exist. So we wanted to standardize recruitment procedure. And uh, the other point is that there are very good sociodemographic statistics available on school composition. So you can get information on what are the sociodemographics of the students attending each school in the US. And we can use that then to target our recruitment uh, procedures. What we did is a demographic analysis. So primarily, primarily focusing on race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status, like I say for the most part, and, and urbanicity of all the schools that fell within a site's recruitment area. So what we did is we then created lists of schools that match that site's demographic targets. And we released these lists in a staggered manner to sites. So sites were told, okay, recruitment begins today. These are the schools that you should go to to try to recruit kids. And the reason why it was done in a staggered manner is that we were then able to monitor the demographics of the sample as it accumulated. So we were able to see if we were hitting our socio-demographic targets or if there was a deviation. So let's just say we realized early on that we were recruiting far fewer Hispanic kids than we had anticipated. What we could then do is in the next release of school list to sites, we would skew that so that it included more schools that had a greater proportion of Hispanic kids in attendance at those schools. And we could do that both within a site, but then also between sites. So let's say for whatever reason, a site was not uh, uh, doing as well as it had hoped in recruiting Hispanic kids. We could then adjust the demographic targets at some of the other sites who were doing a better job of recruiting Hispanic kids so as to um, arise at a, at, a, at a good balance. And again, by actively monitoring and carefully releasing which uh, schools sites should recruit from, we were able to keep track of the demographics and hopefully arrive at the eventual targets that we were aiming for. The other nice thing about this feature is by selecting based on the schools, it means we didn't have to you know, ask participants who were interested in the study uh, you know, potentially invasive questions about their race or their family income or household education that was at the screening. We didn't have to exclude any winning participants. So we rarely turned participants away who were interested in, in, in the study. Instead, like I say, what we did is we just monitored who we were recruiting and then made these adjustments kind of on the fly as the study went, went ahead. Uh, as an aside, the twins are different. So you know, twins are relatively rare. So we have four main twin sites amongst our sites in, in the study, in the consortium. And so four of them are, you know, real uh, experts at recruitment of twins. Most of their twin recruitment was done through birth registries. So a different recruitment strategy for the twins than was done for the, the general population. Okay. Um, this was a lot of work. Um, I just want to say this out loud uh, so that you can appreciate it. You know, it's not as simple as just going out to schools. Before we even get started, we reached out to, um, well, we had letters of endorsement from, you know, lots of, you know, national bodies. We would then uh, reach out to state education departments um, and, you know, talk to them about the study, get letters of endorsement from them to do the study. Then we would reach out to a school superintendent, tell them about the study, show the endorsements that we've received on the state level. If the superintendent would agree, we would then reach out to the school principals within that school district. Again, giving and showing all the endorsements, explaining uh, what the study was about. If the principals were happy, we would then uh, reach out to the teachers and to the students and to the parents. We'd give in-class presentations about brain development, about mental health development and then just provide recruitment materials to the kids to bring home, to chat with their parents, contact us if they had questions. We had you know, 12,000 kids to recruit in about two years, so it was a very, very labor intensive time uh, to try to recruit the sample. Um, <clears throat> we did have a lot of support. Um, a lot of the recruitment materials were prepared uh, sort of centrally with uh, significant support from the NIH. So lots of this material is things like this. So they did a really lovely job 
in creating all these materials that were again somewhat standardized but then also um you know made specific to each individual site so that we could use these um and to get all our our you know our literature our websites set all the information out to the uh, interested families so in addition so i like to say mostly it was done through a school based recruitment but there were a few exceptions during the ramp up period, you know, as you would have seen from the previous slide, it took a while to get the school based recruitment up and running. Uh, a number of sites used mailing lists because, again, they just wanted to fast track uh, the recruitment. Um, over the summer vacations, when students are at schools, we continued recruitment from going to you know, summer camps, YMCAs, and so on and so forth. So, sort of more ad hoc recruitment procedures there. We did allow referrals from enrolled families. So if a family uh, that was enrolled was to say to us that they have a friend or a cousin whose kids would be interested, even if they weren't within one of our schools so on one of our lists, we nonetheless allowed those. Uh, the hope was that if you've got, you know, families that are kind of, uh, you know, let's say relations or neighbors or friends, that they might have retention if both their kids, if, if both families have kids in the study. Um, we also allowed in very limited numbers uh, ad hoc volunteers. Uh, so every now and again, people will come to us and say, oh, I've heard about your study and we would like to enroll. Is that possible? You know, as a general rule, we didn't want to encourage that, but we did think that it had certain advantages, for example, to be able to enroll homeschooled kids. So we allowed those in um, uh, on occasion. And importantly, and I really would stress this as being a very, very important feature of the study, you know, most of us involved in the study are, you know, psychologists, are neuroscientists, uh, heavy emphasis on neuroimaging. We're not epidemiologists, um, but we had an epidemiological expert, Stephen Herringer from the University of Michigan, who essentially guided us in all of these steps and who kind of helped us uh, articulate and develop the whole recruitment strategy, the whole sampling of schools. But also he was very, very helpful as we were making decisions as we went along. Like, is it okay to allow this particular family in? Or is it okay if we reach out to this YMCA? How will that affect the overall epidemiological strategy? So having an epidemiological expert as part of the team uh, was actually a tremendous boom to the study and really, really helped us considerably. Yes, just how much fun was recruitment? For those people who were involved in the study, uh, this will probably elicit PTSD like flashbacks. Uh, you'll see here uh, what this is, is the recruitment numbers over the two years. So we started back in September, October of 2016 and went for about two years. And you know, you'll know, you see the targets were aggressive for the first you know, considerable chunk of time a year. Most sites were not hitting their targets. Some sites joined the study late, so that's why their uh, their lines, uh, you know, start later on the on the x-axis. Um, it was a lot of effort. The reason why we did this monitoring was to essentially identify what was working. So some sites would be, would, you know, did better. Uh, than others and so we would have them share their best practices with all the sites and that was a way to uh, for each site to help each other out and you know and also as we as we went along you know some sites as i mentioned earlier did adjust their targets some sites that were doing better than they anticipated increased their targets and some sites did the opposite but we ended up with a final sample actually you know to be honest and i should know this but I think the final sample is, it's somewhere close. It's maybe 11,877 or maybe 11,878 or maybe 880. Uh, I think it varies a little bit depending on how you count them, but uh, essentially just shy of 12,000. And across all sites, as well as the four twin specific sites, we recruited 1,727 twins. Why there's an odd number of twins is a bit of a mystery that I'll leave to you to uh, figure out. One thing I will mention, we have 10 sets of triplets in the study. Um, I have no idea what the research question is, but I think somebody should do something with that. The recruitment sources. Um, so if we exclude the birth registry twins, this is uh, how we recruit the participants. So you'll see that the majority, about 70%, came as expected from the school-based system. 
some of our by referrals, the mailing lists, and then the miscellaneous other uh, procedures that were applied. Some are referred to essentially those summer camps. So, you know, for the most part, um, and a few of these are, you know, it's a little bit ambiguous because people might come to us as a referral, but then we find out that, oh, well, they were actually also in a school in which we had presented materials. So they were considering it, but when they got the referral, they came. So very often, there might be a couple of reasons why kids uh, participated. Um, so, you know, these percentages, you know, are not very, very strict because sometimes if there's been multiple points of contact with the family, it's hard to attribute their enrollment to a particular recruitment source. But this hopefully gives an overall picture uh, of it. Um, the final demographics. So what did the sample end up looking like? Um, you'll see there on the left, the extreme left is the average for uh, ABCD in total. So we have 52% uh, male, 48% uh, female. Um, so, you know, roughly 50-50. Uh, we do have uh, uh, participants who, um, you know, give a non-binary classification for their gender. This, I think, is an aside. It's going to be a very interesting question that, that we're going to ask. We're quite curious to see about, you know, neurodevelopment trajectories and so on and so forth, uh, depending as a function of, you know, self-identified gender. Um, age, um, slightly skewed to younger. So 52% of the sample was age 9, 48% age 10 at recruitment, but you know, on the whole, in a nice mix. Um, the race and ethnicity, so to kind of orient you to this graph, if you start up here on the top right, the circle, the annular graph, the inner ring is the uh, target that we set for ourselves. And then the outer ring is the actual sample that we recruited. So for example, to start over there on the top right, the ACS target tells us that about 50% uh, of nine and 10 year olds in the US are white. Uh, our sample ended up being 49% white. Um, I believe about actually it's 13% of uh, nine and 10 year olds in the US are black. We decided to set ourselves a slightly elevated target because we just know from previous research that recruiting uh, African Americans into studies of this uh, of this type is challenging and retention is challenging and that as we get to in a second is um, more than likely due to just you know race being confounded with socioeconomic factors so we wanted to over recruit uh, black or African Americans so we set ourselves a target of 17 percent we ended up recruiting 15 percent of our sample Hispanic the target um, was 22 percent we got uh, sorry 22 percent we got 22 percent a slight under recruitment in Asian Americans. And interestingly, other here, it's a peculiar category. It's a bit of a miscellaneous category. It includes both uh, smaller racial groups like uh, you know, Pacific Islanders or Native Americans, but then it also re includes individuals who report multiple races. And quite interestingly, um, we found considerably higher numbers of families reporting multiple races then uh, do so in the American Community Survey. And we're not sure why. Um, this could just be a, a cohort effect that maybe people are just more attentive uh, to their um, racial background. I want to ensure that they give um, a, you know, a more complete summary of their racial background. But, um, but you know, uh, SLB, it's just kind of an interesting feature of the study. The twins population, again, uh, you see there on the bottom, Twins tend uh, to have different sociodemographics than the general population. And again, we are recruiting primarily from four twin sites. So we don't have the same latitude uh, in, in how we recruit twins. So we have to adjust our targets. Um, but, you know, the point I guess I would like to make from this slide, even though the match between our sample and our targets is not perfect, it's pretty good. We have good race and ethnicity diversity in our sample. So we were quite pleased about that. Uh, other factors of interest, uh, socioeconomic status, again, just to orient the, uh, you to this, we start on the left-hand side. Um, on the, um, you see there on the graphs on the left, ABC general population refers to the, the non-twins members of our sample and the highest household education 
So from doctoral degrees down to less than high school. Then you see the breakdown for the ABCD twins. And then finally the American Community Service. So that was our target. And then on the right hand side, you see sort of a similar breakdown, but for household income. So the, um, the percentages of um, uh, in these different kind of income brackets, both for our general population, for our twins, and then our American Community Survey sample. So again, if you, you know, if you pause for a moment, you know, this, this is useful information for you to be aware of when you're conducting any analysis that you're interested in. Uh, socioeconomic is, you know, so consequential um, in terms of, you know, health disparities and opportunities and so on and so forth, you know, lifestyle factors. Um, you know, what do we take from this? Our ABCD sample is not perfect. It doesn't match to the American Community Service statistics, you know, percentages perfectly. Um, I don't know if we ever really expected that it would be perfect. But what I take from this is, although imperfect, we do have good diversity in our sample. So, you know, just for example, if you look at household income, uh, you know, although we might, you know, we are uh, skewing towards uh, wealthier families. So if you look at our 11% and 29% compared to the uh, ACS targets, those are higher. But, you know, if you look at the lowest income brackets, you know, less than 25K a year, you'll see we have good representation there as well. So even though our sample is not perfectly matched demographically to the targets, we would still like to think that it has, we've been relatively, relatively successful in getting a good range uh, across this, you know, socio-demographic uh, variables. And of course, this gets more complicated to, uh, if you wish to get more stratified. So here, for example, if we look at highest household education broken down by race and ethnicity, you know, that's when you start to see that, yeah, for certain subgroups, you know, a certain race or ethnicity in a certain household education bracket, that's when those numbers and the discrepancies with our targets might start to get, um, you know, more and more problematic. So for you, as you're doing your analysis of interest, it's just useful to be aware of this. And before you design, you know, a particularly complex analysis with a particular stratification, you know, look to see if the numbers are there, if they would support the analysis that, that you wish to do. Uh, we didn't recruit for this, but then just a few other characteristics that we thought might be relevant to look at. So things like family type, you know, is the, is the kid coming from a family that's married for, uh, let's say both parents uh, are in the labor force or just one? Is it a single, um, uh, a single family? And, and so on and so forth. Household size, two to three people, four, five, six. So again, you'll see the statistics for the ABCD sample, and then you see them for the American Community Survey. Again, not a perfect match, but I would say not a bad match for sure on some of these, um, some of these features. So to come back to this question, so does all of this mean that we have ourselves a representative sample? Um, short answer is no. Um, why? Basically, because not all US kids had an equal chance of participation in the study. As you would have seen in the map earlier, we have a finite number of sites that are in specific locations, and each site defined its recruitment catchment area, and kids in those areas got invited into the study. There are a lot of kids in a lot of places where we didn't recruit who did not get invited to participate in the study just because of the pragmatics. So in that regard, you know, this is not a true random sampling of all the nine and 10 year olds in the US. So by strict criteria, you know, one shouldn't really report this as a representative sample. You know, is this consequential? You know, maybe, maybe not. I'll just give you one example. This is a study that was published just last year where um, the, the authors looked at our kids identified, this is a study looking at eating disorders, calculated the percentage of our kids in our sample who had an eating disorder, and then because, and it's just quoted there, they you know, interpret our study to be a US representative sample, they then just extrapolated from the prevalences within 
our sample to the prevalence of eating disorders in the US. So kind of a straight extrapolation from our numbers, our samples numbers up to the population and did so, I believe, because they assumed that ours was a truly representative sample. So things like that might be imperfect. And that's why we don't want to mislead users of the data by saying, you know, our sample is representative. Mind you, how you define representative is hard. There's no easy way to, uh, to do this because, you know, of course, even if you were to invite every single nine and 10 year old in the country to participate in the study, you're going to have probably the biggest source of bias is that some people will say yes, will choose to say yes, and lots will choose to say no. People ultimately self-select into the study. We can't obviously coerce people to participate. So whatever it is about those people who are interested in participating in the study, probably in, or immediately creates some sort of a bias. So there's going to be numerous sources of bias in the creation of the sample. And really the point, maybe the whole point of this entire lecture is just for you to be aware that of our recruitment methods and our sample characteristics, so you can decide, is this consequential for you or your research question? There's no kind of simple solution here. You just need to be aware of how we got these kids, what are their demographics, what might you need to do if this is pertinent to the particular analysis that you choose to do. I won't go into this because I'm anticipated to be covered in other lectures, but we do have statistical approaches where you can sort of weight our sample in such a way so that it better reflects or that it can better extrapolate to the US population. So this is a procedure called propensity weighting. And so those options are available and that will hopefully give you those better, you know, prevalences for the population by the appropriate weighting, given the actual demographics of our sample compared to the US population. But um, I suspect those techniques will be described uh, elsewhere in the course. So how do, we, uh, how do we finish this particular issue? We encourage people not to say representative sample because of the baggage that comes with that. But we do want to convey that this is a very diverse sample and it was the sample was recruited in a, you know, in a very intentional way. This wasn't just, you know, randomly going out and grabbing any kids who are willing to participate. There was a kind of a, a you know, an, an epidemiologically informed strategy that underlay the sampling approach. So the language that we use uh, in our studies is that we describe the sample as either being, you know, demographically diverse or population based or some words like that to convey that it wasn't just a convenient sample, but nor is it truly a representative sample. Okay. Okay. Last section I want to talk about just in the last few minutes here is retention. So this is the biggie. Um, we can recruit these kids. We can do lots of fun things with them. Here's a bunch of kids from the Vermont site where, you know, we bring them to a, you know, a baseball game every year. They're told to wear, you know, the t-shirts that they get. This is part of the swag that they get for participating in the study. Uh, we have, um, and we try to do this to kind of, you know, maintain contact with the kids, with their families, ensure that they're, you know, enjoying their participation in the study and that there are these little, you know, added benefits. We do have a dedicated retention working group and, you know, we focus on monitoring retention, identifying any trends in who's withdrawing, who's missing assessments, building predictive models for who might withdraw, sharing best practices across sites. Uh, working with sites who might be showing an increased number of missing visits or withdrawals and so on and so forth. And this group is going to be very, very busy uh, for the, the remainder of the study. I'm not sure I'll go through this. I'll just leave this up on screen for you uh, for a second. But, you know, these are the sorts of things we talk to sites. So we notice that a site is doing a terrific job. Um, They're not having very many withdrawals at all the percentage of kids who are coming in for each assessment. And you probably know already from the other lectures, you know, we have interactions with the kids every six months, um, you know, lab visits annually. They include MRI every second year, but every six months we have telephone calls with the kids to get, a, you know, some data with, from them. Um, some sites do really, really well, some sites not so well. So we talk to the sites that are do well, doing well figure out what's working for them, what are they doing, share that information with all the sites, and hopefully in this way, 
uh, we'll keep the, um, the attrition down. So again, things, again, I said I wouldn't read it, so hopefully they've been up there, but it's really just trying to work with the families, trying to be as flexible, trying to accommodate them, trying to figure out what any of their challenges are uh, to keep them in the study. Thus far, you know, so this study, what I say, it started back, recruitment started in September, October of 2016. So we're quite a number of years in. Our retention rates are notably high. We have had just over 1% withdraw from the study. Now, we're not complacent. We know that the kids, they started at 9 and 10, so now they're 11, 12, 13. Still very much probably their participation is, um, is driven by their parents' interest. We know that as these kids become 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, it might become a lot harder to keep them in the study. Um, but thus far, our numbers are great, uh, surprisingly good. We're monitoring it. So for example, this shows you sort of an accumulated a chart of kind of the accumulating withdrawals. We can break this down in multiple ways. We have tons of these metrics. These are all kind of interactive tools that are developed by the Data Analysis Informatics and Resources Center to enable us to, uh, to monitor what's happening. We can look across sites. You can see there up in the, on the right-hand side, again, those graphs that you might be, um, uh, apologies for that, those graphs that you might be familiar with. We have the inner ring is our full sample, the outer ring is actual. So for example, our full sample, 50% is white. Uh, our withdrawals thus far, 44% of the kids who've withdrawn uh, are white. Um, the, as you kind of look around that circle, you'll see that we have, you know, an increased percentage of Hispanic kids, you know, relatively high numbers uh, of Hispanic kids who have withdrawn. So the Hispanic kids constitute 22% of our sample, but you'll see they constitute 34% of all withdrawals from the study. So this is the sort of information that we can use to try to figure out what sort of trends. Again, you'll see the same breakdown for income, for education. You'll see for income there that a disproportionately high number of the kids who have withdrawn relative to our sample are from lower income brackets. Again, perhaps not surprisingly. So again, it's useful for us to know this so that we can proactively put in place the strategies to, um, to you know, decrease that, uh, th that attrition. Um, and on and on. So again, I don't think I need to talk through the details of this with you, but it's essentially just to, um, to let you know that as well as looking at withdrawals, because our total number of withdrawals is small, again, remember just over 1%, what we're primarily focusing on now is who's missing assessments. So the idea being that if a kid has missed an annual lab visit and then missed the following month, you know, six month assessment, this is probably predictive of an eventual withdrawal. So we are monitoring carefully who misses visits. And again, you'll see here the same sort of strategy. We look at the, you know, the percentages of our sample and then the percentages who are actually missing visits. So for example, just to start in the top, um, let's say the top right-hand corner there, if you look at income, you know, that lowest income bracket, families earning $25,000 or less, they constitute 17% of our sample, but, they constitute 31% of all missing visits from the study. So again, it tells us that the lower income families are having a harder time making visits and therefore are probably at elevated risk of um, pot potentially withdrawing eventually from the study. And again, similar breakdown for the twin sample. We have, a, like I say, lots of these tools to help us monitor what's going on with the study. Um, we can look at who exactly is missing uh, assessments. So, for example, over on the left-hand side there, you know, we can identify kids who've missed, not who've, kids who've not just missed visits, but have started to miss consecutive, vis uh, consecutive assessments. So maybe they've missed an 18-month assessment and then a 24-month uh, a assessment. How many are missing consecutive assessments? And then on the right-hand side, how many participants have just missed one assessment versus two, three, four, five, and six, and so on and so forth. And uh, this information is then made available to sites. So sites actually know which of their participants have missed once or twice or three times. So when they're then reaching out to the family to, uh, you know, let's say schedule their next assessment visit, 
they will know, ah, this is a high risk individual. They've missed a bunch of assessments. I really need to talk to them about what we can do to facilitate. Do they need a taxi sent to help bring them in? Do they need childcare provided because they've got younger siblings in the family? What do we need to do to increase the likelihood that they will come in and complete the assessment for us? Um, these are other sort of metrics. This is a way for us to tell about the timeliness of assessments. So up there on the top left is the ABCD study. The six months assessments, you know, they happen six months from the initial recruit, uh, you know, consent date for the participant, uh, you know, six months, but it's, you know, plus or minus 45 days. So we can see, are those assessments happening early? Are they happening late? Um, for the most part, you'll see that that distribution, the first one there is skewed to the left. It means that once a six month window opens up for an assessment, for the most part, sites are very good at getting that uh, information uh, early and then it sort of tails off. This is the one year assessment, the second uh, histogram here, the sort of light blue or gray, um, you know, uh, dictated primarily by the availability of the testing facility. So more normal distribution. Uh, that is happening, you know, somewhat early or somewhat late, but generally sort of centered around the due date of the one-year assessment and so on and so forth. We then have that information for each individual site. So we can see how sites are doing in terms of timeliness of their assessments. Are they being late? Are they being systematically late in their assessments? And if so, that's a flag. And then we can reach out to that site to find out what's happening. Uh, COVID, of course, has been problematic. Um, you know, there's a lot going on with uh, ABCD. We have hundreds of assessments per week across our, our sites. We move very quickly to a virtual assessments, so online and at home. We are now in the process of transitioning back to hybrid assessments. We've tried to move as many of the assessments as possible to sort of an online platform so that uh, the amount of time that families need to come into the lab is greatly minimized. Um, and you know, that actually benefits us because there's now, of course, you know, uh, lots of additional time taken up with uh, cleaning and so on and so forth and you know, sanitation procedures. Uh, of course, this is a challenge. I mean, a lot of the things we're asking about, we wanna make sure that we can get uh, truthful, honest, frank, safe answers from the participants. So moving it to online is not trivial. But I think we've been very successful in, in doing that. So missing data is, inev is, is inevitable. Um, we simply can't have this amount of disruption. You know, with most labs shut down for six months without there being some missing data. So we're trying to mitigate that as much as we can. One interesting silver lining, and I think this is kind of interesting. Um, as of, you'll have seen in the previous slides, a lot of our missing assessments tend to show a sociodemographic bias. So sort of, you know, lower income families are missing more assessments. Now that we've moved to online assessments, there seems to be much less of that, uh, which is interesting. You know, you take away the burden of having to come into the lab, even if we're providing taxi services, even if we're providing, um, you know, uh, uh, childcare uh, facilities, there's nonetheless that bias. When we move to online, that bias seems to be great, uh, greatly diminished. So I think this is a useful lesson for us to have learned. And I would imagine even in the post pandemic era, when everything is reopened. I'm sorry, that's a fire alarm that's just gone off. Uh, hopefully I can keep going here and that doesn't keep uh, uh, reactivating. But the point is we may want to keep going with as many virtual assessments as is feasible uh, for the duration of the study. Okay, to finish up, uh, the two uh, articles that I have suggested for reading are one that describes in developmental cognitive neuroscience just the recruitment procedure. And then another one that we felt prompted to write this one by um, Compton is essentially just getting at this issue as to whether or not one should describe the ABCD sample as representative. And so hopefully those two will give you a bit, bit more background information uh, on the study. Um, I, I realize, you know, doing all this online is, is, is complicated. Uh, obviously, I'll be happy to take your questions now. But if you do have any questions that you don't get to ask, please feel free to email me. There's my email address there. Uh, feel free to reach out to me with any kind of questions that you might have or didn't get to um, uh, didn't get to ask today. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, take care, everybody.